Hi there, welcome to Leading Lights. I'm Greg Donaldson. There is a great prophetess and leader in the Bible called Deborah. Today we're learning about her story and it will help you, whether you're a male or a female, it will help you to know how God wants to use you in service of Him. Stay with us. God bless you. I'm going to start with Judges 4 verse 3. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron. A chariot of iron in those days, we're going to see a little bit later that Israel had no weapons, not even one weapon, nothing to fight with. And yet their enemy had 900 chariots of iron. These were like, like a huge nuclear tank in our day. They were just impregnable and so powerful and so scary. And the oppressing army had 900 chariots of iron, undefeatable. And for 20 years, he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. So my first point is that the society, the nation was broken. We're talking about broken heroes, but we need to understand the society they were living in. From 20 years of oppression, the society was broken. Judges chapter 5 is a song written by Deborah after the victory. And we're going to pick out little bits from the song to show us what life was like. Judges 5 and verse 6. Imagine Deborah, Debbie, singing her song. She says, In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted. The travelers walked along the byways. Nobody walked along the main streets. That's how oppressed and sad and terrible life was. Danger was everywhere. Verse 7. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel. There was none of the normal life of family and society. Village life ceased. Until I, Deborah, arose. Arose a mother in Israel. And I want you to make note of that word mother because it's important. A mother in Israel. Verse 8. They chose new gods. Then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. The enemy had so oppressed and so controlled the Israelites that nobody had a weapon. They had taken everybody's weapons. Nobody could walk in the streets. Village life had ceased. The society was broken. People were living in fear. And after 20 years, people had got used to living like this. We have no weapons. We have no strength. We have no life, but we're just going to live like this. We're just going to be passive and oppressed. And I want to say to the people of God, it's time to rise up. We learned last week that every um, victory and violent act in the Old Testament is a shadow or a picture of a spiritual victory and spiritually violent defeat of the devil in the New Testament. And so we want to learn how to rise up and stop the devil from causing us to be oppressed and to have no weapons anymore. And Deborah is the example. So the society was broken. I want to show you next that the people were broken. The people were broken. It wasn't just an external oppression. It had, got, it had seeped into their spirits and they thought they were defeated. They had no courage left. Verse 10 of Judges 5. Deborah sings, Speak, you who ride a white, on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, who walk along the road, far from the noise of the archers among the watering places. Basically what she's saying is all the judges and the rulers of Israel who should have been standing up and being brave and saying to the people, come on, have courage, they were hiding away from the watering places. You know those places where everybody goes, the water cooler at work where you go and get a drink and everybody chats? The watering places in Israel were deserted and the leaders should have been there, but they were hiding because of the archers of the enemy. The, the bow and arrow soldiers of the enemy were guarding the watering places so nobody could get a cool drink and nobody could listen to the leaders. Do you feel like that sometimes? Judges 5 verse 2, Deborah sings, When the leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise or bless the Lord. She's saying, I wish the leaders would lead, but they won't. Verse 9, My heart 
is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. And then she goes into a bit of her song where she praises the two or three leaders of tribes who did help her fight, but then she mentions the ones who didn't. And in verse 16, she says, Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings for the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. So Reuben were cowards. They just sat among the sheepfolds. When she was calling them to war, they just hid. She says, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain on the ships? Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the, on the heights of the battlefield. The people were broken. When Deborah asked Barak to help her, this was her main army leader. He says, she, she called him and she said, God wants you to raise an army. And in Judges 4 verse 8, Barak said to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. He was very timid. She asked him to do something. She asked him to pick up what he could do. Just take that thing that you can do. Do it. God is calling you. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And he says, if you go with me, I'll do it. He was a broken man. And Deborah, in a motherly way, says in verse 9, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you're taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. There's something so motherly and so beautiful about the way this lady leads. She says, come on. He says, only if you come. She says, okay. But you know you're not going to get the glory and the, and the credit that you should have got. You're not going to get the reward. Right. So the society is broken. The people are broken. I want to say that Deborah is broken. We read in Judges chapter 4 that Deborah arose as a prophetess. And she would sit under the palm trees called the palm trees of Deborah. And she would give guidance and wisdom. And she would prophesy and tell people what God was saying. But I want to tell you that for a lady in Old Testament Israel to stand there or sit there and lead the nation and have people come to her for advice and for guidance and for judgments, she got a lot of opposition. You know, in New Testament times, the Jews would pray a prayer. They would say, thank you, God, that I'm not a Gentile that I'm not a dog, and that I'm not a woman. How much opposition do you think Deborah got sitting there? She's not pushing her agenda. She's simply praying, listening to God, and declaring God's word and God's will and, and guiding people and showing people the way. How much opposition do you think she got? All those tribes that she mentions who hid in the sheepfolds, who stayed by the seashore, who didn't get involved, I'm sure that they said, she's a woman. You know, the Bible consistently values both genders the same. Values them the same. Not one more important than the other. They have different gifts and strengths and roles and abilities, but of value they're the same. And yet society throughout history has subjugated and pushed down the weak and especially women. And Deborah, to have got to the age she was, she's a mother sitting there judging after many, many years, she would have had opposition. And, and insults and rumors spread about her and horrible things and misunderstandings and people talking behind her back and just a terrible opposition. And yet, she's a hero because she responded in three ways. Number one, she had intimacy with the Lord. Judges 5 verse 3 this is her saying, Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, 
I will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. She was a worshiper. She wrote a worship song, and she was a lady who sat there and worshiped God. She spent time in prayer, and she got strength from the God of the universe. And this is the most important thing about Deborah. She was intimate with God, and therefore, when the voices of people came against her, saying things about her, she could stand strong because she was secure in her God. Listen to Judges 4, verses 4 to 7. Now Deborah, a prophetess, a prophetess, that means a lady who hears from God and declares it. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. That's just an astounding statement in itself. The fact that she had got to this stage of being called the judge of Israel is amazing. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim, and the children of Israel came to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go, deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will, I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. She heard strategy. Now, later on in her song, I don't have time to read it now, but she talks about how God fought for them in the battle. There were only 10,000 Israelites against a multitude of the enemy, and they had 900 iron chariots, and the Israelites had no weapons. But something happened. The river Kishon is a tiny little river that winds through a valley called the Valley of Megiddo. That's where the word Armageddon comes from. It was in that valley. And the river Kishon is a tiny river, but the strategy of the Lord said, go at this time with this many men to this place because the time is right to overcome the enemy. And when she went, when they all went, the, the soldiers went into this valley, the Bible says that the waters rose up. There was a flood and the whole plain flooded and all of those iron chariots got bogged down in the mud and because of that, the Israelites could win. But it was because Deborah heard the timing from the Lord. Now, now is the time. Do it like this, with this many people, in this way, in this place. She was intimate with the Lord. She heard from the Lord. The second thing about her was she had courage to speak out. You know, it's very easy to just get battered down by criticism, to have so many people say so many things against you that eventually you just say, oh, well, I'm not going to speak anymore. But she continued to speak. She continued to sit under her palm tree, listening to God's voice and declaring God's word. She had courage to speak to Barak, the commander who should have been the commander of the army. She knew God had called him to lead, not her, that army. And she said, Barak, it's you. And he says, I won't go if you won't go with me. She says, okay, but it's your loss. She had courage. The next thing about her is she is so secure in herself. She's authentic. I love the fact that she says, God rose up. A mother. She doesn't say, I'm trying to be a man. <laughs> she doesn't say, I'm trying to be something other than I am. I'm trying to pretend to put on a business suit and be like a man and pretend I don't have children. No, I'm a mother. This is who I am. God has made me who I am. God loves me. God has called me. God is empowering me. And I am what I am. And I'm serving God as I am. I'm not trying to be something other. Isn't that amazing? You know, later on in her song, she, um, she starts talking in a motherly way. I just want to read you a few of the verses just to show you that she's not trying to be an army general. <laughs> she's not trying to preach like the preacher she heard down the street. She's not trying to copy somebody else's anointing. She's not trying to be anyone else. David, remember when King Saul wanted David to put his armor on? He said, it doesn't fit me. This, that's not me. I'm the little guy with the sling who fights with the, the stone. I'm, I'm not the, the big soldier with the armor. It's the same with Deborah. She says, I, that's not me. 
And listen to Judges 5 verse 28. Deborah says, the mother of Sisera looked through the window. She's relating to Sisera's mother because she's a mother. She's not trying to talk like a man or like an army general. She's talking authentically. She says, the mother of Sisera looked through the window, cried out through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? Her wisest ladies answered her. Yes, she answered herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil? She knows what it's like to be a mother waiting for her son who's coming home late and starting to go through all the bad things that could have happened and then reassuring herself with all the good things that she hopes happen. She says, oh no, he's, he's dividing, finding spoil. He, to every man a girl, for Sisera, plunder of dyed garments, plunder of garments embroidered and dyed. She's talking like a lady who knows about clothing and embroidery. Two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of the looter. Deborah was authentic. And because of that, God used her. And I want to say to you, God has given you gifts and talents and abilities and opportunities and experiences that nobody else on the planet has. And don't try to copy anybody else. Be who God has made you to be and express the calling that God has put on your life. Women, don't try and be a man. We don't need more men. We need you. Amen? Amen. And then the last thing about Deborah that made her a hero was she pushed others forward. Barak, you lead. You princes of Naphtali, Zebulun, all you different tribes, you guys lead. Oh, praise the Lord when the leaders actually lead. She's pushing others forward. She's not grasping onto power or authority. She's not saying, this is mine and I'm threatened by anybody else who wants to lead. No, no. She's trying to get others to lead. She's pushing others forward. She hasn't got an agenda. She hasn't got an axe to grind. She rejoices when others develop and do more than she even does. And because of that, she sits secure in the Lord, giving prophecies, giving words from the Lord, giving guidance, hearing from her God, and the nation is set free. Mothers in your families and fathers, I want to say, if you, and not just families, businesses, church life, church leadership, every form of leadership, if you will be secure in God, if you will obey Him courageously, speak what He tells you to speak, do what He tells you to do, but try and push others up and not grasp onto leadership and not try and keep others down. If you will do that, people will stream to you like they streamed to Deborah and you will be mighty in the Lord. If you'll be authentic and be yourself, you will be mighty in the Lord. But nowadays, there's just, it seems like the world has crept in and infected the church, so we try to promote ourselves. Deborah never tried to promote herself. We try to keep others down and say, I'm the important one. She never did that. She was humble and she obeyed. And when we do that, God's church will grow strong. Right, I said last week that every week I would try to show you a New Testament example because we read in Hebrews 11 that the judges were great but they weren't complete. Only us in the New Testament can be complete. And so I want to tell you about a lady in the New Testament who is an equivalent of Deborah. And I want to tell you there is a lot of them. In the Old Testament there's very, very few women who were prominent. But in the New Testament, there are a lot. The first person that Jesus appeared to after he rose again was Mary Magdalene. He told her to go and tell his disciples. He trusted her to be the eyewitness. Paul lists all his fellow workers and all his team members and the people he trusts. And there are many, many women's names in those lists. Many. Romans chapter 16, the first half of Romans 16 is a list of Paul's workers and people he trusts and he loves. And there are 10 women's names in that list. 
There's a lady called Junia, who together with her husband Adronicus is called great among the apostles. There's a lady called Phoebe, who's called a minister of the Lord. Um, there are many. Many, many of those ladies. I could list them all. There's, there's several names. But I want to just focus on one. Her name is Priscilla. She was born probably in Rome. She grew up in Rome. She was a Jewish lady, but together with her husband Aquila, they were tent makers. And because they were Jews and maybe Christians, probably Christ, perhaps Christians, they were expelled from Rome. The Emperor Claudius said, all you Jews and Christians, get out of Rome. And she moved to a town called Corinth. They started making tents, set up her little business. And Paul the Apostle arrived in Corinth one day and said, have you got a job for me? And they said, yes. And he explained to them what God was doing in planting churches around the world. And they got inspired. And so a year and a half later, when Paul moved from Corinth to Ephesus, they came with him. He left them in Ephesus. And they set up a business and then he came back a year and a bit later and then the church in Ephesus was born. But Priscilla and Aquila were foundational to the church there. And the great thing I want you to see is that every time it mentions this couple, it mentions them as a couple, Priscilla and Aquila. And while they were in Ephesus waiting for Paul to come back, a powerful preacher called Apollos was there and he was preaching but he didn't know about the baptism and the Holy Spirit and he didn't understand all the ins and outs of of New Testament Christianity and in uh, Acts 18 verse 26 it says he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him they took him aside they explained to him the way of God more accurately it wasn't just Aquila explaining to Apollos it was Aquila and Priscilla together explaining the gospel and Apollos became one of the great leaders in the church, a, a, an apostle of note. Many people believe he wrote the book of Hebrews, we're not sure. But it was because Priscilla and Aquila explained the gospel and then they led a church in, in their home, they moved again to Rome, they led churches there, they were foundational. Paul mentions them as being absolutely essential in the gospel. They risked their lives for Paul and it's always the two of them. And I want to say that in the New Testament God values women. He says you have gifts, you have abilities, you have an authentic femininity about you which we need. But he does say in a couple of places don't try and usurp and be a man. So in 1 Corinthians 11, in that day and age, if a woman took off her head covering or had shaved hair, it was a sign that she was saying, I don't need men, I'm greater than men. And he says, women, you must just make sure that you keep your, your submission in line. Make sure everybody understands you're not trying to be a man, you're trying to be authentic as a woman. And then he says, you can prophesy and you can pray in public as long as you are showing everybody that you, you keeping the order right. And the same goes for men. He says, men, if you try and usurp your position and say, I'm great, I don't need God or whatever, or I don't need anybody telling me what to do, he says, that's wrong as well. It doesn't just apply to women, it applies to both. We should never usurp and say, I'm greater, I don't need anyone over me, because then we don't deserve to be in leadership. And in 1 Timothy 2, he says, women shouldn't usurp authority over their husbands. In other words, try to say, I'm, I'm better. Because there's a humility in Christian leadership. Anybody, male or female, who tries to promote themselves or say, I don't need authority or speaks against authority, should not be in leadership. They have no business being there because it's about humility and saying, God is great, I'm not great. And so the conclusion for us, my friends, is that you and I, Hebrews 11 says, only with us could they be perfect. We have a better promise. We have better things than they have. You can be greater than Deborah. You say, me, I'm nobody. I'm a, I'm a little old nobody. God says, I've put things in you that nobody else has. Get close to God. 
listen to his voice, speak his word, obey when he tells you to obey. Get his strategy and do it, and people will be drawn to you. Your gift will open the way, the Bible says, for you to serve him. But if you try and copy someone else, if you try and make yourself great and say, I'm better than the leaders or I, I don't need authority, God says, I can't use you. But if you'll step forward, God can deliver huge numbers of people through you. You know, nobody else in Israel, in the time of Deborah, nobody else could set them free from the 900 iron chariots. It was impossible. They were under oppression. They were enslaved. They were weak and sad. And God used a woman to do it. And God can use you. God can use you. And if you're listening to this on the internet or on TV and you are wanting to be part of something in your area, we want to help you. God can use you to do great things where you live. Link up with us. We'll pray with you. We'll help you. We'll give you advice and teaching and tools and you'll be able to do great things for the Lord. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Deborah, Lord. Thank you for her humble obedience. Thank you for her intimacy with you. Thank you for the victory that you won through her. And Lord, I pray that you would raise us up to be like her. In Jesus' name. Amen. How do I tell my friends and neighbours about Jesus? How can I do more for God? Have you considered starting a small meeting where you discuss the Bible and talk about God? You just need to invite a couple of people and show them God's love. Leading Lights will help you with the rest. We have free resources, prayer teams and seasoned church leaders who want to help you do great things for the Lord. Visit leadinglightsnetwork.com or download the Leading Lights app from all app stores.